Hello, everyone. This is Alfadi, and uh, thank you, of course, so much for tuning in to this uh, interesting series that we have titled uh, Gibson's Latest Discoveries. And hopefully, uh, you have known now uh, why we called it uh, this, because obviously, we've been uh, unpacking a number of newer things that Gibson is coming across, and rightfully so, they are discoveries that are going to be shocking, without a doubt, simply because they go against the traditional narrative concerning the location of Mecca, the location of the Kaaba, the location of the Black Stone, and on top of that, the direction of Qibla. And now we're talking about Islamic rituals, whether that they are associated with the minor pilgrimage or the actual pilgrimage. With me here, of course, as always, to help me unpack all of this and summarize it is our dear brother, Dr. J. Smith. Welcome back. Well, well, thank you to have me back. You know, I was just thinking as you were doing that introduction, uh, we have to keep on coming back with newer and newer uh, videos and newer episodes because there's so much new material that keep, keeps coming to light. And that is not a bad problem. That's actually a very good problem, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, remember what I mentioned to you uh, earlier is that it's not a coincidence that you find all of these pieces now fitting together. And the narrative about Petra is becoming more of a reality than just a myth. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up this whole section uh, that, uh, concerning the newest discoveries. Uh, we're going to do another one in the spring, probably in the one in the next fall. We'll probably do them maybe twice a year, just have these at newest least, discoveries. At least, yeah. It won't just be G Gibson's. We're also getting some other friends who are coming in. They're sending us new material. Uh, we're, and we want to keep this up as a uh, as an ongoing to help those of you who are actually in uh, taking this and and really engaging with Muslims on it. Those Muslims who are listening to it also, we're finding that you're getting engaged with it. And we also want to make sure that we keep up with the latest historical discoveries. That's the beautiful thing about history. Uh, it's not something you can sit still. History keeps on changing for us because of the fact, uh, the, the, the classical narrative uh, that Muslims have always taught us, and the only narrative we've ever had in any of my schools that I've ever gone to, the only narrative that's allowed to be taught was what we call this classical narrative that started with the premise that there was a man named Muhammad who was born in 570, started receiving revelations in 610, there in a place called Mecca, and from right. 610 to 622, he received these Meccan revelations, and then he moved from there up to Medina, another city called Medina, and from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of his life, he then received these revelations there in Medina, he then died. Uh, uh, he, he took over Mecca by 630. He died in 632, some believe by poisoning. Uh, Abu Bakr takes over from 632 to 634. Umar takes over from 634 to 644 for right. the next 10 years. He is killed. Uh, Uthman takes over from 644 to 656. He is killed. Right. Ali, the adopted son of Muhammad, uh, takes over and he from 656 and he is to, killed. to 661. He is killed by Muawiyah at the Battle of Sifin. Three of the four rightly guided caliphs were all killed. And so this whole, what we know is the Rashidun period, that golden era of Islam from 624 to 661, that 40 year, roughly 40 year period, is the narrative, the only narrative we've ever been told, that this book was then revealed in uh, within 22 years from 610 to 632, uh, that it had to be written first of all, after Muhammad died by Abu Bakr, somewhere between 632 and 634, had to be rewritten a second time in 652 by Uthman, and that this Quran that I have in my hand today, therefore, is that Quran. So all of this is the classical narrative, which we are now questioning because of historical evidence. And we had that whole discussion between King and Gibson, where Gibson was saying, well, let's hold on, let's stop. We're coming up with an awful lot of new material that's, that's right. actually confronting that narrative. And I want to show you what I've discovered. And King gets really upset because this is his area of expertise. And he is the one that has the doctrine. And he is the world authority on the direction of prayer, the Qibla. And he is an authority on all these early mosques, though he only went to one of them. In this whole time that he did his whole career, he only went to one of them to look at what he was, he was talking shocking. about. He, here, Gibson had been to over 100 of these mosques. He actually physically went there and rather than just read books about it from the 9th, 10th, and 11th century, redacting it back to what they thought happened in the 7th and 8th, Gibson said, let's just go and see what's on the ground. And that's why it's fascinating as history now is getting revised. Uh, why? Because because of what we're finding on the ground. Dick Gibson is helping us to revise the emergence part of it, the whole person of who Muhammad was, what he did, what happened, how Islam began. We're now finding it does not make sense for a 6th and 7th century environment. 
it looks like that whoever this prophet is, whoever this one that was given this book, if it even was one man, that right. look, I would suggest because of the fact that we are now at the same time asking the question about the emergence of Islam, we're also asking the question about the emergence of the Quran. And this is being done by the German school. This has been done by Dr. Dan Brubaker, who is now looking at the earliest manuscript, the first one to actually photograph all these manuscripts right. and start asking disturbing questions. He is doing to the Quran what Gibson is doing to the emergence of Islam. These are two historians, and one is a linguist and the other, uh, Dan Gibson is a linguist in Arabic, but uh, Dan Brubaker is a linguist in Arabic, but there's Arabic. other people who've gone before them. You have Patricia Corona and Dr. Michael Cook, who are, she herself ha reads and writes 15 languages, a real linguist in all of these archaic languages. They're looking at the Quran, they're looking at the emergence of Islam, they're looking at Mecca, and they're saying there's another story that doesn't fit the hit narrative uh, that we have been told by Muslims. We thought for 1400 years, it looks like only for 1300 years. So right. it's that that we're not to want to bring it together for. And now we're at that level where we're starting to do a no what if. This is what we think is happening. We think in happening in December. That you have a man named Abdul Malik who wanted to ha create an Arab identity. In order to create that Arab identity, he had to create a prophet. He had to have a revelation. Because the Arabs did not have a prophetic line, did not have a revelation. The Jews and the Christians did. And they're their cousins through Abraham. So that's why he is the one that, that he is the one that introduced introduces Muhammad on the Dome of the Rock, introduces him on the coins, introduces him on the protocol. Once they, he introduces him, what does he have to do? He then has to give him a book because the prophet must have a revelation. There is no book there, and that's why suddenly you see an enormous amount of different fragments. We haven't even got into that yet. Right. The fragments that suddenly appear, and then some bits of manuscripts. We're only talking about 1,400 years ago, so this is not very long ago, and these are written on parchment. Therefore, they're well preserved, but what's problem is not one of these fragments, not one of these uh, manuscripts are complete, and not one of them come from the seventh century. Uh, possibly the lower layer of the Sana'a manuscript that you're looking at, that palm says that could probably come from the last two decades of the seventh century, but once they have the book together, they're starting to put it together, There's no, we don't know when it's complete, and that's the big million dollar question, which we're gonna answer. It's gonna come, folks, we're gonna get to that. We're moving away we're moving the goalposts each time we talk to you we're moving the goalposts so we are going to get to that but once you have the man then you have the book then you have to have the place the place was settled they thought in Petra it had to be moved down to Mecca because of the political problems between the Abbasids and right. the Umayyads the Abbasids went out they now have the new sanctuary and that's why all the mosques start now to face to Mecca after 727 they come into power in 749 uh, but then you've got the place. Then you've got to do something else. If you've got the man in the book, you've got to give him a history, don't you? You've got to start saying who this guy is. You've got to start putting together his biography. So his biography comes first. When is his biography? When is the first time it's written down? Well, I mean, we know that at least Ibn Ishaq wrote it around 130. We're told that, right? Right. But, so uh, where is it? It's destroyed or at least most of it is lost. But we know his student, supposedly Ibn Hisham. All of it's lost around 180 uh, No, basically. that's 765 is is the uh, I, I should talk. say 180 years later. Gotcha, okay. You know, but yeah. who is the man that actually writes it yeah. down? Writes it down. It's Ibn Hisham right. and he's not the student of Ibn Ishaq. He got it from the student of Ibn Ishaq. He and writes that's it another lies, you know, we keep uh, being told that that was his student and things like that. You look at the gap between them and how 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 was he his student when there is such a big gap? 765 to 833. Exactly. But you can see 833 he dies and he is the first to write Write it down. 833 of Muhammad died in 632. That is a 200 years gap. And, and guess what? When he wrote it down, many of his contempor contemporaries even doubted it because they felt like he inflated it and added his own genealogy in there. So another one was written later. Al Waqidi. Al Waqidi. Yes. And exactly. Al Waqidi is a lot more violent. In fact, when you look at Al Waqidi, yeah, that's why he it's talks not about been, the campaigns. My goodness, campaigns. it goes in the Maghazi document. And talk that's about right. Maghazi. It's campaign after campaign after that's campaign. Right. If right. this man did exist, I have no doubt that he probably did exist. I, right. I have no doubt that. We're going to find. In fact, we do have references to him in 634 and 660. Uh, the Doctrina Iacobi from 634. We have the the Chronicles of Sabaeus from 660s. But these are not. Arabs, these are Christians who write about this man. So right. I do believe it existed, but in none of those references is he a prophet. In none of those references does he have a Quran. In none of those references is he a Muslim. In none of the references is there a religion called Islam. And in none of those references is he from Mecca. 
Now, so you are starting to get his his biography put together, and his biography is put together in 833, 200 years. That would make sense. if, And you can understand that there probably was something written by a man named Ibn Ishaq, but remember what Ibn Isham said, I threw out what I didn't agree with. Already there's a censorship going on. Right. So you can see there's a censorship going on between 765 and 833. Right. That censorship makes sense if you're trying to create and, uh, and you're trying to come up with a canonized text. Right. It looks like those who finally agreed with Ibn Isham eradicated throughout everything that Ibn Ishaq said that they did not like, and they only retained that which Ibn Isham agreed with. Even Walt Wakidi is not well accepted, who comes only five years later with his biography that has right. many differences between the two of them. Now, that's the biography. Then what do they have to do next? They then have to write the sayings. Now remember, what is the story about the sayings? What is Al-Buhari given? How many is he given of these sayings? 600,000. Well, at least, uh, I think in one account I read 660,000. He himself discounted most of them, settled on 7,000. And out of that, uh, yeah, and, and some How of them are out of repetition, you know? Well, when you get to repetition, it's only 1,450. But when you look at 7,397, that's just 2%. Exactly. Of the 600. He threw out 98%. And he said because they were fabricated. I mean, he admitted. Who, who, who says they're fabricated? I mean, this is what it's sounding to me. This is standardization at its worst. This, or at its best, you might say, this is censorship. And now, it's worse. Here is the importance of this. You see, when you start looking at history, history becomes important. Right now, there is an Islamic state being formulated, right? You need Sharia law. All of a sudden, Sharia law appears. But you need to justify your rulings. And who's better than to claim Muhammad said this? Muhammad did this. And that's where you get the fabrication basically. Even that. Let's look at that. Yeah. The, remember you have what, before every one of the Akbaris, you have what they call it, Isnad, a list of names from which every tradition gives its authority right. from. These lists of names actually... A chain of narrations. Chain basically. of narrations. So-and-so yeah. got from so-and-so who got from so-and-so who got yeah. from so-and-so. We have in 820 a man named Shafi, who is the one who is the responsible for the Shafi laws right. uh, of, of Fiqh. Shafi, yeah. <coughs> you say it better than I do. Now, Shafi, Shafi is the one that actually designates in 820. Look at the date. 820, so this is right before Ibn Hisham writes his material on the Barak. He says, in order for you to have a true Isnat, for it to be authoritative, it must go all the way back to the companion of the Prophet. Right. But that was only decided in 820. And suddenly, according to Patricia Corona, when she writes about this, she says, and so does Cook write about this, she says, what's fascinating is anything prior to 820 had all kinds of names that suddenly from 820, the name, the list completely changed. Right. How suddenly can someone in the uh, early ninth century know what the list of names is all the way back to the Companion of the Prophet? And how is it that all these lists suddenly include a Companion of the Prophet? And most importantly, how can they preserve all of this in memory for 200 years? And they still come back and claim that, no, 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 they were companions who actually were reporting hadith, but okay, why didn't you collect them? if they were that important. Absolutely. How could you Where know for 200 years, and why is it suddenly the list of names change in the ninth century of all this list to make them authoritative because they had to say who was in the list, who were authoritative. Now, this is done in 820, and then by that time, you then get to the saints coming in in 870. Once the saints come in in 870, then you've got to understand the Quran, and that's why the tafsir only begins to appear in 923. That's the 10th century. So you've got now the you've got the man, you've got the book, you've got the place, you've got the history, you've got the biography, and now you've got the sayings. By then, by 9, uh, 923, the 10th century, you finally have the Islam that we now know today. Absolutely. But that's 300 years too late. And folks, we are giving you a zoom into that new discoveries, the, this groundbreaking history, these facts that contradicts the traditional narrative. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you find it very helpful. I know some of you commented and said that this has been a must need, uh, a must needed information and a must read basically or watch uh, uh, videos. Uh, so we hope that you will spread the word around. Our hope is that our Muslim friends, and I'm hoping that some of you are watching, will take the time to explore and investigate. That's what we ask you to do. Don't take our words for it. Go and investigate for yourself. By the way, Petra still exists till this day. Go and buy the books that Dan Gibson wrote. Go and explore some of the academic articles that are being written and decide for yourself. 
Thank you again for watching. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.